Hello and welcome to Retech and today we're going to look at another machine that's hit its 40 year milestone in 2022. Now if you're watching this a little bit further down the road these machines are going to be a little bit older than that. Now these machines are not that well known outside of the UK and Europe, mainly France because they were a kind of an also ran to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum although they weren't seen as such a big success in the UK when you compare it with the ZX Spectrum but they weren't exactly a flop and I'll kind of cover that in a little while but these machines the Auric One and the Auric Atmos which was basically a modified version of the Auric One in the same way the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus was a modified version of the original ZX Spectrum they didn't do too badly overall because they sold a lot of units now the Auric Atmos is a more conventional looking machine when you compare it to the Auric One. The Auric Atmos here has a, a nice full size full travel keyboard. The Auric One on the other hand is very different in the way it looks and the way it feels. It has a what some people consider a tic-tac style keyboard. Now I absolutely hated this keyboard when it first came out. Um, I just really couldn't get on with it at all. Um, I thought that it was quite easy to miss the keys between the spaces and typing on it you were kind of, you know, it was kind of a bit of a hit and miss affair but it wasn't that bad really because I've been using it recently and I've got to say it's got quite a nice feel to it once you just get used to pressing the rather thin keys on the keyboard but that really wasn't its defining kind of characteristics its defining characteristics were the fact that it was a, a also ran to the ZX Spectrum that's the way most people look at it and outside of Europe as I said not many people will have seen or used one of these machines now why is that well you see this machine was a, a machine that was built from a company called Tangerine Micros and um, Tangerine Computers or Tangerine Micros depending on which advertising you looked at at the time um, started off in 1979 and they produced a, co a computer called the Micro Tan and they produced a number of kits and uh, quite a few machines before settling on what was going to be the home market. Now the home market machines were huge in the era of the early 1980s and the way the Sinclair machines were selling from the ZX81 onwards it kind of seemed a logical step to move away from the more business orientated market through to the home user market but I never felt that these machines really sat in that position I mean they were quite robustly built they had nice cases you know this one's 40 years old and you wouldn't really know it's well built it hasn't cracked it's not brittle it doesn't twist and creak and I kind of got the feeling that they were trying to break into the home computer market to push their next models into the more business and aspirational market which is where they originally started off at but they were sponsored and funded by the owners of the British car auctions which seems quite strange when you think about you know car companies and car people getting involved in the microcomputing era of the time but you know it was the same with the Amiga it was dentists getting involved with um, games machines or what they thought it was going to be at the time and it was quite a big bit of a departure a bit of a step for these people now there were two flavors of the original Auric one the first one was a 16k model and the second was a 48k 
machine, they were both kind of tied in to match the memory specifications of the Sinclair. Although this machine technically has 64K on board, not 48K, but a lot of that's used because of the way it kind of sits in its ROM set for basic etc. So it's literally what you would kind of call now as the operating system side of it takes up that little bit of memory. So these machines were essentially 48K. Now there's a well-known bug in the ROMs on these which persisted throughout the life of the Auric One and the Atmos and that was its tape handling routine. Basically, it was very hit and miss. The verification of loading and saving didn't really work that well. And they were very, very finicky with what kind of cassette recorder you were using, what kind of volume sets you had on, and whether or not it really decided it was going to save your work anyway. And that was one of the biggest drawbacks of this machine. But the Auric One, was quite a successful machine selling around about 160,000 units in its first year of production which you know is not a bad run at it is it really and they kind of moved around a bit as well as a company you see if i look underneath at this auric one we've got a postcode of Auric Products International and it's a postcode or a PO box of Feltham in Middlesex TW13. Now that was technically classed as its head office but 12 months on and the Atmos came out which is kind of a nicer machine virtually based on the same molding and the same casings especially the bottom half and um, it's an Auric PI Limited now. It's not the original company. And it's PO Box 162 Cambridge CB4 1PH. Now, Cambridge CB4 1PH is literally a, a community centre now. It's a postcode for Brownsfield Community Centre in Cambridge and that's the site and the postcode of the original offices or one of the original sets of offices in Cambridge that basically dealt with the Auric. Now that wasn't the only kind of side of Cambridge that this Auric was really linked with. You see their Twickenham offices weren't really where they were based because Originally, Tangerine computers were based in St. Ives. That's St. Ives in Cambridgeshire. In the same postcode as Sinclair's Radionics. Now, if you look at these two postcodes, Sinclair Radionics and Tangerine Computers, these two companies were linked a little bit more than most people actually realised. So it wasn't their first foray into Cambridge. Their main base was in Cambridgeshire. It kind of always had been. They also had an offices or office in Techno Park again in Cambridge. And um, if you see one of my previous videos, you'll see that, you know, when I did the links between all of the original 8-bit micro computing companies, they're all kind of linked within a stone's throw of each other in Cambridge. Now, it seems very, very odd that, you know, all of these micros are kind of developed in Cambridge itself or in and around Cambridge itself. And I'm guessing part of that is because Tansoft, um, you know, basically the software division for Auric, were actually based out of the Cambridge Science Park and remember back in 1981 they would have been one of the new residents to a new building or set of buildings within Cambridge Science Park and that was way back in 1981. Now Cambridge Science Park is huge now it's a massive massive complex 
and it's all run out of the University of Cambridge or Cambridge Universities. They've been very active in the technology and science arena for a lot of decades. So if we take a look at the Auric Atmos, you know, the same ports, the same board virtually as the Auric One. We have power, expansion, printer, tape, RGB and UHF or RF ports, which, you know, is not bad for its time. And that's your complete set of expansion ports on the Auric Atmos. Now, it was a 6502 based machine and it ran at 2 megahertz. It wasn't a bad machine. It was actually technically superior to the ZX Spectrum. Technically, it had better sound. It had better commands for its sound, for some of the music, and it also had a built-in set of zap, ping, and explode, which you could use to write your own games with very quickly and easily. It also had quite a decent library of software, although on its launch, that's what kind of let it down. There was around about 600 titles kind of estimated to be out there for the Auric Atmos and Auric One range of computers. But at its launch, there was nothing of the sort. It was very thin on the ground and the software providers and the writers and the software houses had to start catching up to give this micro something to do. And, you know, Tansoft could only do so much and there were only a couple of employees kind of full-time writing for the Auric One initially. So, you know, it was on a, a bit of a back foot when you compare it to the ZX Spectrum, which had a vast array of software almost straight out of the box. But that was mainly because of its ZX8081 kind of legions, which were behind the Sinclair models. The, the company itself was full of controversy. It was full of controversy. It went in and out of administration at least twice within its lifespan and each time it was fighting for survival. You see at the time of the launch of this machine people were starting to cut prices, they were starting to cut costs on the 8-bit micros that were out at the time. So Sinclair was bringing the price of its 16k model down to £99 and its 48k model to not much more, around about £130. Now, this would have had a marked effect on the Auric One because the Auric One was almost £200 for its 48k model and it put it at a bit of a disadvantage. Also, the advertising from the company um, to try and get people interested in the Auric One was kind of a little bit different. It was kind of a little bit aimed at putting down the competitive machines, making out that this machine was more singing, more dancing, more capable than what it actually really was. Now, if they market it as a home computer, a games machine, something that you could do your accounts on and so on, then it might have gained a lot more traction than it actually did. But, you know, they had a kind of a punch on for detracting other micros, which got them into a little bit of hot water. But on a personal note, these machines did rather well. They, they did well initially in the UK for about 15 to 18 months. After that point, they mainly became a French machine. They were sold in France. They sold very well in France for about 11 months. But then, you know, things again, they went into receivership again and faced bankruptcy, were bought out and, you know, they went down a slightly different route. But that's kind of a story for another day. I'm going to do a full history on this machine, but this machine isn't a bad machine at all. And we're just going to quickly run through some of the good points about this machine. Now, you'll have noticed I'm actually using one of these. It's an Erebus Auric 
tape drive adapter basically because using cassette software on this machine is an absolute nightmare most of the time and this is much much more reliable so if you do have an auric atmos or an auric one get hold of one of these because it makes your life so much easier okay so basically we have an auric auric one running here it's running quite nicely you can see it's got quite nice black text which is lovely when you compare that to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum or even the Dragon 32 with its green on green display and it's quite nice it's very very nice on its display and on this machine we've got 37,631 bytes free now when you use an Auric Atmos you'll find that there's slightly less memory free because it has a an upgraded ROM but even that upgraded ROM didn't take care of the tape loading issues so what we're going to do is we're just going to do the normal C load and we're just going to have a quick look at maybe a game on here it's using the Erebus which is very nice to use and let's have a look. And this is Ghostman and if you can hear any kind of ticking in the background or noises it's because we're in the middle of a storm again and um, it's quite loud with the wind and the rain bashing down at the moment. And as you probably noticed from this game there's a lot of French games because this was a massively popular computer in France. And the Oricon has a built-in speaker it's not coming from the the computer itself. So if we have a quick little bash on this game which not very good at let's try again anyway you can you get the idea and basically it's all right the colors are nice it's um the graphics are okay it's a little kind of primitive if you compare it to a commodore 64 you know this these were early games on the oricon the only downside with this is again it's a cost cutting measure there's no reset on this machine as in a, a reset switch as such there is something on the bottom which you would have thought was a reset switch but it's recessed in there in the actual case itself but you know generally there's not a reset switch so it's a case of powering it off and back on again so we're going to try xenon 3 now as you can hear it's loading up now and again, all of the sounds coming from the internal speaker on the Auric One. The biggest problem is, is there's no volume control on it, so you you know you would have a bit few problems in keeping the volume down. But a lot of um, games producers got around it by doing a software volume, such as you could select zero, one, two, three, and four. So as you can see, the uh, Auric range of computers weren't too bad in the game playing stakes they could produce roughly the same graphics as ZX Spectrum with arguably better sound. They weren't quite as polished as the Commodore 64 in the sound stakes and also maybe the sprites that were used on the 64 were much better at producing games that were a lot slicker and looked a lot more polished so when you compare it to the micros of the time such as the dragon and the msx machines it was virtually on par with them and you know the more i've used the auric one the more i've actually liked this little keyboard the more i've got used to it 
and the less of an imposition it actually was. So, you know, my opinions kind of changed a little bit on this keyboard. I've always liked the look of the Auric One. I think it's one of the nicest looking machines that you could buy at the time. And when they were out, I actually toyed with actually buying one instead of, you know, one of the Sinclair machines or the Dragon machines, etc. And um, at the end of the day, I'm quite glad that I didn't get involved with all the turmoil that was going around with Auric at the time. But overall, it's a good machine. It's a forgotten machine by many and it's an unknown machine by more. So, you know, I hope this kind of sparks you interest in the Auric One. I will be doing a full video on absolutely the entire history of the company because it's just amazing. It's amazing how they even survive more than a month, let alone almost 10 years. The Auric One in the Auric Atmos and the Auric brand was out there for. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you soon. Please subscribe and I'll see you soon. Thank you.